Good afternoon and welcome to the Carnegie Council lunchtime webinar series. Just going to wait a moment here to let everybody log on. Wendell, thanks for joining us from your home in Connecticut. Thank you, Joel. So thanks everybody to, uh, for tuning in. Um, today's topic is agile global governance, international cooperation, artificial intelligence, and public health. And our guest is our good friend, Carnegie Council Senior Fellow, Wendell Wallach. Wendell is consultant, ethicist, and scholar at Yale University's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics. He is also a senior advisor to the Hastings Center, a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology, and a fellow at the Center for Law, Science, and Innovation at the Arizona State University. Additionally, Wendell is lead organizer of the first International Congress on the Governance of Artificial Intelligence, a project which I hope we can discuss in some detail in the next hour. I first got to know Wendell when he came to Carnegie Council to discuss his first book, Moral Machines, and then his next book, A Dangerous Master, How to Keep Technology from Slipping Beyond Our Control. What started as mutual interest in the ethics and governance of emerging technologies has become a long friendship. So I, Wendell, I hope you'll consider this discussion as just another step in what I hope is still a long journey ahead. Today, I want to, we wanna talk about the tech response to the pandemic, specifically the use of big data and artificial intelligence as we move from the initial acute lockdown phase that is coming next. Among the questions are, how have international institutions used big data and AI in their responses to the pandemic so far? Has this new stress to the system highlighted the need for more agile global governance when it comes to emerging technology? Or has international governance of AI and other emerging fields of research been set back by the pandemic? Now, before turning to Wendell, just a word about our format. We've asked Wendell to kick things off with a short presentation. After that, Wendell and I will have a dialogue, but the back half of the program will be interactive. So we uh, encourage you to use the chat function to pose questions. And when we get to the second half hour, our moderator, Alex Woodson, will read questions on your behalf. So over to you, Wendell. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, Joel. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you today. And I'm honored by all of you who have overcome your Zoom fatigue and tuned in to join us today. I know that sometimes returning to your computer and watching one more discussion can be a, a bit daunting in these times. Of course, the good news is that we can attend meetings in sweats and comfortable clothing. And if you're bored or sleepy, you can at least turn off your camera and nobody will know. My comments are going to be more or less on the order of the good news and bad news that has emerged from the, from the present pandemic and how that has affected our ability to both deploy and provide some degree of oversight for emerging technologies. This forced shutdown has given many of us uh, a significant opportunity to reflect in ways that perhaps we have lost over the, over the preceding months. I mean, just a few weeks before the shutdown, I was on a half a dozen flights to various corners of the world in preparation for the International Congress for the Governance of AI. And with the shutdown, um, I have not traveled in two and a half months. The first stage was really reflecting on the total uncertainty, the uncertainty about the, the flu itself, the coronavirus itself. We, uh, we still don't understand a great deal about it, and it seems to be altering its expression in various ways. But also just to assimilate what was taking place. The world has shifted, and our minds and bodies need to take in a great deal to just get a sense of where we are and what the opportunities are that are opening up and those that are disappearing. 
Now that window for reflection seems to be slowly closing as society tries to reopen. My greatest fear, and it's not just set off by this pandemic, but it's been a concern in regards to emerging technologies over the past decade, is that we're gonna get so overwhelmed in reacting to crises that we lose the capacity to shape humanity's future. And this is being exacerbated by this present health and economic crisis. Not only are we being forced in addition to our previous concerns to manage the pandemic and restart the economy, but we are going to have to address the needs of the hundreds of millions who have been, who've had their lives totally disrupted by this tragedy. The UN World Food Program has estimated that those who are marching towards starvation has doubled from 130 million before the pandemic to roughly 260 million now. And that will be actual starvation if we don't find effective means to mitigate it. The UN Secretary General Gutierrez, in a speech a few months back, stated what he thought were the four modern horsemen of the apocalypse. They were climate change, geopolitical tensions, mistrust, and the dark side of technology. I'm gonna talk mainly about the latter two, but let me say a, a few words about climate change and geopolitical tensions. The good news is that we are suddenly having all these wonderful videos of animals in city streets and vi visions or pictures again of the Himalayas peeking out over cities in Asia, such as Kathmandu, um, and uh, Chandigarh, cities that have been so ensconced in pollution that you only periodically, if ever, get to see those mountains. The bad news with climate change is that even with this major shutdown, this time out, we are not flattening the climate change curve. It continues to go up even if at a slower pace. So even if we could establish the technological usage, the spewing of, of carbon into the atmosphere at the level it is today, that would still contribute to continuing climate alterations. Geopolitical tensions, normally a pandemic can increase the degree of, of international cooperation, and we have seen that. We have seen countries all over the world uh, establish measures that limit the transmission of the virus. But we are also in a period of heightened tension. This is not being helped at all by the fact that this is an election year in a deeply divided United States. Traditionally, you would turn to the World Health Organization and the CDC as late as major factors in mitigating a pandemic or even a, even a simpler epidemic. But the, on the international stage, the CDC has really had a rather minor role. And as most of you are aware, there's been a great deal of pol politicization over the World Health Organization's efforts. Now, the World Health Organization is a body, like many of our international bodies, in need of serious reform, but reforms are pretty difficult to direct our attention to in the middle of the pandemic. And really, they, are not, they should not be a primary concern given how much the World Health Organization does to ameliorate the various health crises that we are dealing with. Mistrust, I think, is a, is a more serious issue and one in which technological oversight is somewhat complicit with. We are in many countries of the world flirting with what Jürgen Habermas called a delegitimation crisis. That's a crisis when significant portion of the citizenry loses any faith in their institutions to meet their needs. Now crises, underscore existing trends while changing the course of history. And one of the existing trends has been this exacerbation of inequalities. 
and that has been truly and seriously highlighted by this pandemic. We are now basically two worlds when it comes to people who, who are, do or do not have economic, economic well-being. And I suspect that nearly everyone listening today is among those for whom they have not lost their job, the most serious consequences may be the health and loss of life for those that they are close to. But we also often have the assets that we can meet our needs, not only today, but we anticipate for the near, if not distant future. And as we all know, that's not true for a vast, vast majority of the world's population. So how are we gonna address that? What roles will technology play in addressing that? And what are some of the trends that this pandemic is underscoring in terms of technological development? First of all, it is strengthening the digital economy. Online retailing is booming. In fact, the digital economy from the perspective of the stock market is booming. NASDAQ is higher than it was before the onset of the pandemic. Large chains are being seen as essential businesses while small businesses are being kept closed. And that's going to create significant disruptions in who survives and who does not survive and what is the character of our life as we come out of this pandemic. The power of the information age oligopoly is growing dramatically, while the efforts to rein it in have been weakened. Furthermore, there's an increase in the movement toward a surveillance economy, an increase in the pushing of tech solutions as being the way in which we are gonna solve nearly every issue in our society. Now, as has been the case for many years now, there's an exaggeration about what tech can and cannot do. We've been watching some exaggerations of what AI can do in helping mitigate some of the issues that are raised by the pandemic or solve the public health crisis itself or even help find a cure. But those, those exaggerations are often way ahead of what we're actually witnessing. And yet it is true that tracking the disease and digital tracking in particular using your cell phone is actually going to be one of the greatest tools we have to to at least mitigate some of the effects of the pandemic and interestingly enough there are a few companies such as uh, moderna which two days ago not announced results from a drug trial that show that uh, a significant number of those who had used the drug, when we're talking about significant numbers, we're talking about trials with eight and 10 and 25 people in a group, showed the production of antibodies that could, that were similar to those that we see in people who have actually had the disease. Of course, we still don't know whether these antibodies do, do demonstrate an effective vaccine against getting the pandemic again, getting the coronavirus a second time. And some of the anecdotal evidence, such as that from the naval carrier Roosevelt, is that there's at least a half a dozen sailor, sailors who had coronavirus who have gotten it a second time. And there are similar anecdotal stories coming out of Japan. Now, I've taken a particular interest in the governance of emerging technologies because I recognize that these technologies do offer our greatest hope for solving some of our most serious problems. The uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, the hope is that those can be met by 2030, and that's certainly not going to happen unless we get major catalysts from technological tools. But I am also, as is Antonio Guterres, I'm concerned about the dark side of technology and how we're gonna mitigate that. 
I've also been concerned about the lack of agility in international governance, the need for multi-stakeholder input. We are in a situation right now where our world is being rapidly remade by emerging technologies, and yet very few people have an actual say in which technologies get deployed. I've been concerned about the complexity of the challenges and about the fact that many of the people, particularly in public life, who have to make the decisions do not really understand the technologies they're making decisions about. And furthermore, the, the challenges are so complex that even those of us who have a fairly transdisciplinary appreciation of what's going on don't fully understand, nor can we predict how this is going to unfold. There are tens of thousands of research trajectories in, in emerging technologies, and nobody knows when the breakthroughs will happen and in which order those breakthroughs will occur and how they will impact each other, or the synergies that will be created out of the ways in which they interact. So nobody can really predict how this information age is going to unfold and which of the challenges are gonna need our attention uh, most quickly. And finally, I'm particularly concerned that there's a lack of good faith brokers. In this breakdown of trust, significant por portions of the populace no longer trust traditional experts. They don't necessarily trust science. They don't trust those of us who try and develop expertise and, and work to educate and help others understand the challenges at hand. And this is a serious issue. I'm not sure how you move to this dramatically transformative world if you cannot establish a degree of trust, because without trust, you don't have social cohesion. Now, there's been a mismatch in the speed of technological development and, and scientific discovery and the deployment of new technologies. And this mismatch has been with the slow pace of traditional forms of governance. The slow pace is endemic to most of the institutions that are in place. It is exacerbated by the lack of knowledge about the technologies that need to be governed by the lawmakers. And in the international realm, another contributing factor is the fact that we have weak multilaterals a very weak multilateral system in serious need of reform. Furthermore, it's not only a weak multilateral system, but in many cases, the multinational corporations have much more power than all but a few countries. Now, technological reform has always been stymied by what is referred to as the Colling Ridge Dilemma. The Colling Ridge Dilemma goes back to to a 1980 book in which David Collingridge said that it is easiest for us to, to regulate, to shape the development of a technology very early in its history. But early in its history, we don't really know very much about how it'll unfold. And by the time we do know how it'll unfold, it is so deeply entrenched in the society that is often too late to alter its its overall trajectory, its overall influence, its overall power. And this Colin Ridge principle has been taken to heart by many legislators in a kind of binary sense where they, they shake their heads as whether we can do anything. But I and most of those of us who believe in, in the ethics of emerging technologies and the governance of emerging technologies kind of reject this binary thinking. We do believe that you can institute ideas very early on, some of which will, will take seed, some of which will lie fallow, but you can nurture those ideas and you can see which can actually flourish over time. And we do have a little bit of time in some of these areas, uh, artificial intelligence and the, uh, its autonomous, per, perhaps capacity to take to uh, take authority and decision making that really isn't that deeply entrenched yet. So that's an area, for example, where there's plenty of time. 
<clears throat> or at least some time. But that doesn't alter the fact that we need to, to begin addressing these issues now. And when we organized the International Congress for the Governance of AI, the main idea in our mind was to get us beyond broad values and individual policies and begin seeding the creation of mechanisms that could effectively govern these emerging technologies. In that regard, we instituted some, some experts meetings around the world. One was in Delhi, another in the UK, another at Stanford University, in which, which we brought together individuals with some expertise to come up with some proposals for how we might move forward. One core proposal that I hope to talk a little bit more about this morning is global governance networks, which is an idea for multi-stakeholder, multi-level multi trust networks. So let me just stop there and see what else we might, uh, we might discuss. Thank you very much. Wendell, thank you very much. You've given us a lot, a lot to think about. Let me um, try to extend the conversation in, in one particular direction. Um, so the idea of these emerging technologies, they are by definition global in scale. And so what we're looking at is the governance of these technologies in some global capacity. And what we're seeing now in, 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 international, in the international world is sort of a fracturing of the global system. Uh, and, in, and in particular, uh, we can look at it as, uh, you know, the West um, and the rest, if you will, or the West and the East. Um, I like to think of it as, uh, you know, we have sort of open societies and perhaps those that are moving to a more closed um, system. But um, that's a long way of asking, how do you think about um, the different political systems, in particular China, as, uh, as one particular model and how that sort of fits in with your concept of some kind of global governance mechanism? Thank you, that's a great question, Joel. I think as you and many of the people on this call already know, I've been going back and forth to China um, until travel shut down roughly every, every two months or so. And now, now they're dragging me into, uh, into some of these online forums in lieu of the fact that uh, various events will not take place in China over the, uh, over the summer and, uh, and fall. My own, uh, the nice thing about doing that is you get a very different perspective of what's going on in China than that that is pervaded in, in the US and, and in a lesser sense in Europe. I think, uh, well, I mean, let me just start with a little example here. You're in this age of this pandemic, we're all very forgiving of the fact that that the television news shows we show aren't very aren't very well engineered, that oftentimes people are coming on with Zoom and we can't hear them very well. We're willing to take that into account. Uh, we're willing to take into account that there may be people, and I don't include myself in that, who don't have their pants on, but but we'll never see that, you know, when they are when they are in these meetings, something that would be un totally unacceptable in, in a traditional meeting. Um, we have become increasingly intolerant of everything done by those who do not share our ideology. And we get overly carried away by emphasizing what they do wrong and um, and perhaps under generous in terms of what what is done right and that has created a condition in which we aren't able to give people their due but we are so critical we're so critical that even when something egregious takes place, it has no weight because our adversaries are looking, are being looked at as not understanding what we're doing or why we're doing it. And I think 
That's no less true in the way in which China and America view the, each other as it is in how we view those of different political persuasions within our own, within our own countries. So the interesting thing for me in being in China is you know, getting an on the ground feel for what's going on. One of the things I, I see that's going on is the vast bulk of the population is very happy with their government. Much more happy than I would say Europeans and Americans are with their governments, with our own governments. And it does seem to be a genuine happiness or genuine, genuine pleasure. Now, sure, there are people who, who resent the fact that they can't openly criticize their government, that, uh, that there's not as much tolerance for, for criticism or individual expression as there may be in the West. But they also are witnessing the fact that their government has taken 800 million people out of poverty in the last 40 years. There's nothing comparable anywhere else in the world, and at least in the present, things are getting better. So that's not true, obviously, for the Uyghurs, the Muslim minority, which is being repressed. That's not true for everyone. But I, I think we lose sight of that. The, another thing we lose sight of is this discomfort that China has with the stress on human rights, even though human rights, even though they have signed the International Declaration on Human Rights. And in this series of lists of values for the governance of artificial intelligence, the Chinese um, emphasize harmony over rights. Now, that's deep within their culture. It's not being done just to, to quiet criticism of the government. It's a great deal about what that society is. And they've been through tragedies in their past that make them very uncomfortable with the kind of, of, of individual self-expression that Tend, that they see as undermining communal solidarity. So again, we aren't taking the time to have those conversations, to see whether we can come up with a consensus about where human rights really should be the framing reference for the development of international governance, and where, where perhaps it, what it means or how human rights might be deployed might not be the same in, in all societies. I'm not trying to be an apologist here for China. I'm just trying to say that it looks very different to me once, I, once I've been there. The other interesting point is even though China is, is ruled by one party, I think that beyond criticism of the government, the party listens amazingly closely to the wants of their citizens. Now, the great bulk of the citizens are of one ethnic background, so there may be more uniformity there, but I sometimes think that China is perhaps even more responsive than our so-called democratic, democratic open societies. So that's speaking about China itself. But yes, there are challenges with China, there are challenges with societies that are, aren't open, and there are even more serious challenges with autocratic nations that uh, don't even try and create the illusions of being beneficent. Yeah. And I'm particularly concerned about that with both the beneficent and non-beneficent, but also even the democratic countries in terms of the adoption of technologies that increase the ability for surveillance. Great. Well, you and so, Wendell, you have a big idea. This isn't just an observation here. You have a big idea of what to do with this, um, which is the um, the convening of an international congress, a first international congress for the governance of AI. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about your your concept for that. So, a congress uh, implies representation. So there'll be representatives. Uh, not only uh, from around the world, but as you were saying before, multi-stakeholder or multi-sector 
Um, so I'm imagining it's not just, you know, national representation and so on, but we have representation from, uh, from um, the tech companies, uh, from civil society, yeah. that, you know, this sort of notion of some kind of inclusive conversation about where, where we're going with emerging tech. So maybe you could just say a little bit more about the Congress itself and how you're thinking about that process. Sure, sure. Well, let me, let me first give you, give a little bit of background. At the time when we started organizing an international Congress for the governance of artificial intelligence, there was actually very little happening internationally. There were certainly meetings on cybersecurity. There were meetings on digital standards. There was a little bit of, uh, of discussion around privacy. Uh, there was certainly meetings around uh, whether lethal autonomous weapons should be restrained. That was the context in which we walked in, and we tried. We began organizing a Congress that we saw as a multi-stakeholder forum. So, so business would be represented, governments would be represented, uh, civil society would be represented in in many different forms, including uh, you know educators and NGOs. And we also were particularly concerned about having significant representation from underserved communities, including indigenous, in small nations and indigenous populations. Now, since we began the organization of that, there's been a dramatic shift. And the shift is that a lot of multinational or multilateral, excuse me, organizations are jumping into the space. The UN, the OECD, uh, the, the G7 with leadership from Canada and France, uh, the World Economic Forum is, has been weighing in on that, the G20. And so that's shifted a little bit what the Congress may or may not be. Uh, because in effect, the governmental leaders and to some extent the corporations with a little bit of representation from the NGOs have started organizing independently. And therefore that has made the Congress that, that we were, um, were planning, that was to have been in Prague in April, has been postponed to Prague in October, and I suspect well, we will uh, postpone it again till, uh, till, till next May because I, I doubt many people will be traveling in, in October, but, but we're still monitoring that. That's made our stress much more on the multi-stakeholder dimension of bringing people together. And we do believe that if the stakeholder groups are significant enough, then that will get enough of the national and industry leaders to, to also show up. So in that regard, we've been looking at various proposals and initiatives that would help nurture multi-stakeholder development. Now, we are not in a position to have a Congress where, where we can determine who the delegates will be or whether they are proportional. So this is not gonna be a Congress in any true legislative sense. And it may actually be very limited in terms of what comes out of it or what kinds of initial clout it has. But my own concern is a bit broader than that. I think we need to begin laying the foundations for the 21st century institutions now. And in many cases, they are going to need to, to replace some of the inter international institute, multilateral institutions we have that are not very effective and particularly in technology they need to be much more multi-stakeholder because we can't be what shall i say reinventing the human species perhaps even out of its own out of, out of its own existence without an actual participation from the world citizenry so the multi-stakeholder dimension becomes really important and in that regard, we've been working particularly hard to ensure that element. We've been working particularly hard to ensure that China will be present. And they did commit to me uh, that they would be present. We, present. we have even invited um, uh, Madam Fu Ling, 
to, uh, to be one of the vice chairs of the Congress, which was to be chaired by Michael Mueller, who had stepped down as director general of the UN in Geneva. And another initiative we have been engaged in is been trying to help nurture a network of stakeholders from small nations, underserved communities, indigenous populations. Now, I don't belong to any of those communities, but that hasn't altered the fact that actually by making it clear that we wanted their representation and we'd even have a training session for those who were not digitally literate in advance of the Congress that were, have been able to stimulate developing that a bit. And indeed, we even had, um, we even had a foundation which wanted, wants to remain nameless that has given us a matching grant for scholarships to bring significant representation from that community to the Congress. Now, whether the Congress happens or not, those are, those are seeds that need to be germinated. And that's, uh, that's a lot of what we're focusing on at the moment. That's great, Wendell. We're gonna to get to the question soon. So I have one last question though, and it's building on where you left off with, with regard to the Congress. It would seem to me, um, in addition to political interests, which you've discussed, there are um, really massive um, economic interests, commercial interests at stake in terms of the development of these technologies in, in artificial intelligence and so on. And so one question for the Congress is, you know, how are you thinking about representation from the, the sort of tech world, uh, those with commercial interests at stake? And, um, you know, how do they how do they respond to this initiative? Uh, do they see it as threatening or do they see it as something that's perhaps helpful and complementary to the development of their business? Well, as you can imagine, there are many corporations and they have very different value structures and very different goals. And uh, some, some have, uh, I've used Microsoft as an example of a company that has tried to put uh, its values up front. But other companies, um, uh, their public, public and fiduciary responsibility to their stakeholders is foremost in their minds. And uh, they've been quite happy to stymie governance as much as they can. So it's very mixed in terms of what participation they will or will not have. Uh, our hope was that enough of them would participate in the Congress that the others would see that as important. And we have had uh, partnerships with various corporations such as uh, PwC, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, we've had uh, we've had participation from Microsoft and Google and in some of our experts' meetings. So, so that's something to be nurtured. And uh, I don't think it's going to be easy. But I also think that the corporations do not want if you actually have multi-stakeholder input and any consensus, the corporations don't want to be seen as ignoring the voices of the citizenry. They also may want to try to persuade them or educate them, depending on you know, corporate perspective, toward their viewpoint and why perhaps the way they feel that uh, digital security should be organized makes more sense. And, uh, than some of the some of the public concerns that are coming up in GDPR and other areas, but I also think that a lot of the corporations see that their livelihood is going to come from implementing long-term platforms that actually that actually um, put a little bit of teeth on the values that have been most explicitly expressed as those of the public wants. So, so they'll participate sometimes begrudgingly, sometimes they will see it as an opportunity to create an alliance with, uh, with the other stakeholder groups. But again, I do don't think this is an overnight venture. I think we are truly taking first baby steps toward building the international governance mechanisms for the, for the for, for this new century. 
and um, will it succeed? Will it fail? Well, it has a lot to do with what kind of world we're creating. This world could very easily deteriorate into total distrust and chaos at this moment, but there's also this opportunity for cooperation and exactly how we're going to come out of this global pandemic is, is far from clear at the moment. Thanks. Um, I'm going to turn now to Alex Woodson. And Alex, can you uh, help with uh, some of the questions from the audience? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joel. Thanks. So this question is from Joseph Carvalco. He writes, are we speaking more about a constitutional convention, which designs the governing architectural institutions that will de then develop the legislation needed to regulate AI in the future? I think it's much too early to be talking about that, but, but, but thanks for the question, Joe. That, uh, we're a long way from a constitutional convention. We can't even get, a, we can't even get any kind of a treaty on limiting the deployment of lethal autonomous weapons, even though I think those who have argued against such weaponry have won the battle from the perspective of public opinion, but they probably lost it in terms of getting the major, the major international powers on board. So I don't think we're in the realm yet of any kind of a constitutional convention, but I think we're gonna get beyond, beyond the broad values that have been expressed and perhaps um, start looking at ways of implementing those values of first steps toward putting in place institutions and then perhaps down the road, we can begin to talk about new actual, um, actual international mechanisms that have a little bit of a clout in terms of, of enforcement. But at the moment, neither, neither the leading nations nor the corporations want any kind of international mechanism that has much enforcement capability. And this is already becoming problems for the EU and GDPR and some of the other mechanisms that are already being put in place. Great, uh, another question about the Congress. This is from Joel Marx. Do you anticipate participation in the Congress by any religious entities? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I could say more, but you already have the Catholic Church, for example, that's jumped into the artificial intelligence space. And we do have as advisors and as people who, who, were, um, who were going to speak, be speakers at, at the Congress, we had people involved with the, uh, with the Catholic Church, but also um, at the moment, we didn't yet have leaders from other denominations or other um, other religious religions, but uh, I suspect I suspected that we were about to. We were talk we were talking with a good number of them. Okay, and we'll keep on the, the Congress questions. This is from Bill Armbruster. Has the Trump administration shown, shown any interest in having the U.S. participate? Also, have you contacted the International Chamber of Commerce? You know, I never contacted the International Chamber of Commerce. I have no idea whether they, they, whether they were contacted or not, but we had a number of, of interactions with, with people in the Trump administration. And the week before we, um, the week before we postponed the Congress, uh, I was just a few days before we postponed it, I was at the OECD for an AI meeting in, uh, in Paris. And uh, at that meeting, uh, strangely enough, it was just a few days before a postponement. I, I was, even though I was keeping an eye on the, on the coronavirus, we were still talking to leaders in terms of whether they would show up or not. And there was leadership from the US there. In fact, the chair of the OECD's meeting on AI1 is, is from the US. And they said they, they were considering it. They, uh, it was kind of in the form where they were at, they had act, actively been considering it and they but they still had not made a final decision about whether to come or not it looked if the, if there had not been a pandemic it would look like we were 
building the kind of momentum for the Congress that a lot of the bench sitters would have decided in the last minute that they would come, that they needed to be there. But we, we didn't have any upfront commitments from the Trump administration. Okay. This is from Keeping on the Congress. A lot of questions about the Congress. This is Patricia Rosenfield. Uh, she writes, I appreciate the heter heterarchical approach to participation in the Congress, but how does that play out in terms of local institutional developments and governance as part of global governance? Um, did I misunderstand it? Did she say hierarchical approach in relationship to the Congress? Heter heterarchical? Maybe, maybe she meant hierarchical. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I think we're trying to not be too hierarchical and to be truly uh, multi-stakeholder. But as you can imagine, uh, and it's probably true of all of us on this call, we, by and large, most of us belong to the halves of the world. And we are people who have had significant roles within both local and international institutions. So it's always a question about, about who represents the others in the world? Is it going to be the paternalism of, of civic civil society, or can you actually get some more grassroots participation? So we were making efforts for participation from underserved communities. But the other thing that the IEEE had proposed for the Congress was um, a focus on local governance and smart cities. So they were actually putting together a program so that we could learn from the, the governance tools that had already been developed for smart cities and whether those might be scaled up to nations or even international. Keeping with Congress questions, it's from Eugenio Garcia. What role do you see for the United Nations in AI governance? Will the Congress in Prague have any outcome shared with the UN as a platform for inter international discussions on global challenges? So again, we are moving in a more pluralistic framework than one where it's determined who or what will have roles. We don't really know at this point. There's suddenly a lot of institutions, including the UN, that are jumping into this space, and yet it's not clear what they will actually take responsibility for. So we have more than 55 lists of values for AI. And by some counts, there's 80 to 100 documents that could be reduced to lists of values. So a lot of people are jumping into the space, but it's not clear what the UN will take responsibility for, what the IEEE will take responsibility for, what the World Health Organization will take responsibility for. So our way of looking at this was to flag to help map who is taking responsibility for what, flagging the gaps, and seeing which of those gaps might be addressed by existing institutions. That's the first point. The second point is we already had significant participation from the UN and from representatives to the UN from ind individual countries. Uh, the UN was not in a position of giving a flat endorsement of this project. But that didn't alter the fact that there were uh, individuals with major positions within the UN that were, that were coming to the Congress and expected to be presenting there. And I think they also were looking for what the UN should be. In addition, the Secretary General has a higher order, higher level panel on digital security that I and many others on this call participated in and contributed to its output and that some of the individuals who are on that panel were part of the organizing committee for the Congress. So this is all by way of saying that there's a good number of us who float from organization to organization and have been engaged in a process of, of weaving the different organizations together and in trying to facilitate that we work cooperatively and not competitively. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is from Zoe Stanley Lockman in Singapore. Question is, how centralized do the expert groups envision the mechanisms to be? And how can international governance efforts avoid turf wars with extant organizations that see themselves as inhabiting the space? 
Can you read that second part again? Uh, sure. And how can international governance efforts avoid turf wars with extant organizations that see themselves as inhabiting the space? And I should also say that Patricia Rosenfield is wanted to clarify that she meant heterarchical, not hierarchical. Hierarchical is the opposite of hierarchy. And um, I'll read the rest of what she wrote at, at the next next chance that we get. There are there are two things going on. There are there are people generating proposals, and there are initiatives going on all over the world to try and flesh out the values that have been espoused by different organizations. We don't know exactly how that's going to unfold. We were largely looking for for first of all methods to to coordinate the different initiatives or at least get them working together and aware of each other's activities and who was taking responsibility for what and secondly addressing those issues that perhaps were being overlooked so that that's our concern here it wasn't that we have thought through in great detail we had proposals particularly this uh, global governance network uh, that we, we hoped would be acted upon as, as a first step, but exactly how that unfolded would again be determined by who participated and what their intentions were. I looked at myself as a facilitator, not a determinator of, of what kinds of mechanisms would be put in place. Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to bring it back to the pandemic. Um, one is uh, from Carnegie Council's Billy Pickett, just very general. How has COVID-19, how has artificial intelligence been used in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic? And then Christopher McRae asks uh, more specifically, are there any states that have started to use AI to trace the virus? He writes that he's in Maryland, close to the NIH, and he says that Maryland has not begun to scope the data that is needed. So there are, there are uses of artificial intelligence to, to, to track the virus. Some of these maps that are being created have, have been generated with the help of artificial intelligence. I think there's been on one level disappointment that artificial intelligence doesn't do more, but that's because artificial intelligence isn't that intelligent yet. Um, it is remarkably helpful in helping us, us manage large bodies of data and perhaps ferreting out relationships that we might might miss otherwise but its greatest contribution so far has been in the ability of researchers to utilize it to help ask some of the questions that they need some hard um, empirical information to, to pursue the uh, the main way in which artificial intelligence have you consider artificial intelligence has come into play in this in this space is in contact tracing and the value of contract contact tracing hopefully everyone understands that it's essential for us to ensure that we don't have flare-ups of the pandemic but it's heavily dependent upon personal data and the good news is that there have been researchers looking at ways that that personal data stays on your phone and does not become the property of some other entity that uses it for their own purposes. I'm curious about Wendell. We have a lot of great questions, and hopefully, we can do something to uh, to to answer these off the off the Zoom call. But just just one question, maybe to wrap up. You mentioned because it's such an important point. You mentioned how the pandemic is increasing. The rate of starvation for hundreds of millions of people. So I'm just wondering if AI can be used to help some of these some of these issues uh, related to the pandemic, not related to the pandemic. How do you see AI helping some of these huge issues that that we're dealing with now? Well, I do think it can help. I mean, it can help in 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 supply chain management. It can help in tracking where there's need. It can be it can be utilized by those who are trying to, to address the needs of those who, who are in difficulty to, to, to know in advance what they should anticipate. So again, AI can help in all of these regards. Emerging technologies have become fundamental tools for us addressing, for us to address all challenges 
the difficulty is it's not so intelligent yet. So the intelligence is really collective. It's the way in which the tools that do exist are being used by the experts to try and answer the questions that they need so they take appropriate steps. Um, we're coming up to one o'clock, so we'll conclude the, uh, the formal session. But um, as you said, Alex, um, I hope people will feel free to reach out to us and to reach out to Wendell uh, to, for follow-up questions. And uh, as we've discussed, the uh, International Congress uh, will be proceeding and we'll keep people informed in terms of the, uh, the future of that, of that program. So Wendell, I just want to thank you in particular. Uh, not only are you a, a wise observer of what's happening in the emerging tech space and in the governance space, but um, I really admire the fact that you've stood up to do something and uh, the uh, whole idea of organizing a international Congress uh, is a big idea and uh, you've stepped up to it and uh, the Carnegie Council is really proud to be uh, a part of it. So I'll just conclude by reminding people that uh, the webinar has been uh, recorded and we'll post it to the Carnegie Council YouTube channel, uh, also to our website. And uh, we'll have a, another conference next week where our senior fellow, Nick Rosedev, uh, will be the host. And the topic is what Americans think about foreign policy. And that will be based on research published by the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations and the Eurasia Group Foundation. So thank you all for joining us and hope to see you next week. Thank you.